Trinity. I'm Kohei Ito from Keio University. Uh, today I will be talking about three things, plus one if I have time. First, I'm going to talk about coherence time of phosphorus electrons and nuclear spins in silicon. Uh, we have obtained close to one second T2 of electron coherence and also close to almost three seconds of nuclear spin coherence in silicon. And then I will talk about noble silicon isotope effect on phosphorus NMR, uh, which I'm sure you will actually surprise, be surprised if you understand what I'm trying to say. And also I will be talking about some uh, electrically detected electromagnetic uh, resonance and so on. My collaborators are, the, uh, first of all, my students. Uh, Mikio Eto is a theorist and also Steve Lyons' group from Princeton, John Morton's group from Oxford, uh, Leonid Vlasenko from Yofe, and so on. So I guess the motivation here is that, as you know, Bruce Kane proposed using phosphorus as quantum bits uh, embedded in silicon. So uh, you, man, uh, manipulation and detection of phosphorus nuclear spins as well as, as, well as electron spins is very uh, important or interesting. And also we have proposed together with Yoshi Yamamoto, uh, utilization of 29 nuclear spins can lead to uh, fabrication of um, efficient quantum computer made, made entirely of silicon. So the idea is the following. Uh, silicon, naturally av available silicon, is always, always composed of three stable isotopes shown here, 28, 29, 30, and they are always given in this ratio shown, uh, indicated here. Among the three, only one of them, 29 silicon stable isotope has nuclear spin one half, while 28 and 30 do not have any, any nuclear spins. So only with silicon, and also with germanium, we can obtain stable isotopes with and without nuclear spins among semiconductors. We are going to introduce phosphorus into silicon, and phosphorus, in the case of phosphorus, it is made of one isotope, phosphorus 31, and that has nuclear spin one half as well. So the first thing we we're going to try is that uh, we're going to put phosphorus in a matrix of 28 silicon, which does not have nuclear spins in the background. And then we try to study coherence of electron bound to phosphorus, and also coherence of 31 nuclear spins. And Phosphorus, as you know, is like donor. It's, it's a hydrogen because it has one nuclear spin and one electron spin, and they were bound to each other by Coulombic interaction. So because it, phosphorus has one nuclear spin and one electron spin, it, has, it, compo it makes four-level system under uh, externally applied magnetic field. So you have combination of electron spin down up and down, uh, electron spin down, nuclear spin up, electron spin down, nuclear spin down, up down, and up up and so on. And we would like to study uh, the behavior of phosphorus, for example, by shooting or by irradiating the energy corresponding to Electron, electro, elect, electronic, electron paramagnetic spins, param, paramagnetic resonance, and also this transition between these two levels correspond, corresponding to NMR, or sometimes we call it NDOR. Okay? So the first topic is coherent time of phosphorus electron spins in nuclear spin free silicon. So we are going to eliminate. Uh, background silicon nuclear spin as much as possible and try to see how much we can extend the electron spin uh, decoherence time, okay? Cohe or extend coherence time. So here is, I show the previous results, uh, the results obtained prior to our measurements. Basically, our colleague, Steve Lyons' group, have shown that as a function of the temperature, T2 could coherence time, not T2 start, but T2 goes up to about 60 mil or a few milliseconds uh, in the measurements. And the field square shows T1, which can go up to 10 to the 3 seconds and so on. And more recently, we have been able to prepare silicon, bulk silicon, which compose of only 50 p 
ppm of 29 silicon. So it's a 0.005% 29 silicon. So it's 29 silicon is the one with the nuclear spin. So we have successfully suppressed the background nuclear spin down to this level. And we obtained that with spin echo measurement, we obtained T2 of 0.6 second at 1.8 Kelvin. Okay? And this actually shows that our new measurements actually goes up to, uh, goes along with the screen line. And we have obtained at 2 Kelvin or 4 Kelvin, the T2 time close to one second. And this is nicely, this green T2 is nicely following T1. There's a relation 2 T1 equals to T2 in a limit of, and then um, the difference between T1 here and T2 here uh, is due to some kind of spectral diffusion as we, and also there is a w cause of this uh, spectral diffusion which is due to interaction between donors. So because we have been able to uh, suppress the background 29 silicon, now what is limiting the coherence time is the interaction between phosphorus and phosphorus. So I show here in the same background 29 silicon concentration sample, uh, cons uh, cons different, uh, sample with different concentration of phosphorus, which leads to difference in uh, coherence rate or decoherence rate. So here I plot one over T2, one over T2. It's a decoherence rate as a function of the donor density. And it clearly shows that higher the density, larger or faster the decoherence. Okay, higher the decoherence, right? And this shows that because we don't have any background 29 silicon, uh, now interaction between donors, even at the concentration level of 10 to the 14 and 10 to the 15, they are, electrons are talking to or interacting with each other, and that leads to decoherence. And the fact that the, the decoherence rate is proportional to donor density uh, or distance to the minus third uh, indicate that it is actually due to dipole or interaction between donors. So that's a decoherence mechanism. Now we are going to talk about, so far we've discussed about the electron coherence, but now I'm going to talk about the nuclear coherence of phosphorus 31. So phosphorus 31 nuclear coherence we have obtained by endor, pulse endor measurements uh, is, are shown by red. So here's 31 phosphorus nuclear T2 as a function of the temperature. This is 8.5 Kelvin, this is 5.5 Kelvin, and this is coherence time. And the black squared shows electron spin lattice relaxation time T1. So why am I showing electron spin relaxation and also nuclear spin T2 at the, on the same panel. The reason is that this indicates that actually we have phosphorus, nuclear spin, and we have electron bound to phosphorus. And when electron bound to phosphorus relaxes, that relaxation leads to decoherence of nuclear spin, phosphorus, nuclear spin, and a core. So this is the main mechanism of decoherence of phosphorus 31 nuclear spins. When we suppress the background 29 silicon concentration in silicon. So here again, even the phosphorus nuclear spin coherence or decoherence rate depends on the concentration of phosphorus. So interaction between phosphorus donors affect the coherence of nuclear spins that are, that are sitting in the middle of donor positions. And what is really limiting the, the nuclear spin 31 phosphorus nuclear spin coherence is really interaction between electron and electron spins uh, through dipolar couplings. And this happens only when we eliminate the background 29 silicon concentration, nuclear spin concentration, and other defects. So now I'm moving on to the second part of my talk. Uh, but in, in any case, uh, even though uh, nuclear spin decoherence is limited by electron-electron uh, interactions. Uh, the nuclear spin decoherence is close to three seconds, so that's very long. Now I'm going to show you phosphorus 31 endor when they are placed in silicon. 
let's say NMR. Here, the 0.01% or 0.3% or 1%, or 4.7%, and so on, the percentage shown here indicate the background 29 nuclear spin concentration. So it just shows how much nucle nuclear, 29 nuclear spins we have in background. So we have silicon, we have some amount of 29 background, 20, uh, silicon, 29 nuclear spin uh, uh, placed around phosphorus, and we measure phosphorus NMR frequency. When background 29 silicon nuclear spin is very small, as small as 0.01, NMR, NMR per peak position and also peak width of phosphorus 31 is very sharp. And then as we increase the background 29 silicon, the peak position shifts to higher frequency, NMR peak position shifts to higher frequency, and also the, the width broadens. And what is interesting here is that when we increase the background 29 silicon up to 10% or 50%, we start to see many NMR peaks of phosphorus 31. First, we were very surprised with this you know, observation. Then we start to think about what those peaks, we clearly observe one, two, three, four, five peaks, as I indicated here, as zero, one, two, three, four. And later we found out that these zero, one, two, three, four corresponds to number of 29 nuclear spins bonded directly to phosphorus. So we have phosphorus and it's, it's a silicon, so we have four nearest neighbors to this phosphorus. And then if 29 nuclear spin number is zero around in a nearest neighbor, the peak appears here. So zero is those peaks indicated like this. One, peak one is, uh, is the case when only one of four nearest neighbor 29 silicon is, well sorry, nearest neighbor silicon is 29, 29 nuclear spin, two, three, and four. So as you can see, zero peak shifts uh, to the right, and this is most likely due to dynamic, dynamic nuclear polarization and one peak appears, two peaks appears, and so on. You may ask how we confirm that this is really the number of nearest neighbor 29 silicon. This can be done easily by estimating the probability of having uh, nearest neighbor 29 silicon. For example, for the case of 50% background 29 silicon, the probability of having two 29 silicon close to phosphorus is the largest, and of course this is a probability we can calculate easily. And we, only with this amplitude, uh, we can actually uh, reproduce the intensity of zero, one, two, three, or four peaks. When we have background 10%, we get those are the, the probability of having zero, one, two, three, four, 29 silicons around phosphorus, and with these ampli amplitudes, we can reproduce the uh, NMR or Endor uh, intensities very well. So the conclusion here is that even the tw NMR frequency of 31 phosphorus is affected strongly by the number of nearest neighbor 29 silicon as well as with overall background uh, concentration of tw nuclear spins. And um, it's only by suppressing the background 29 silicon we can get very sharp and also well-defined peak which is ne necessary for quantum information processing. Okay. And as I said, zero peak, I indicate zero means zero and 29 silicon peak shifts uh, as we increase the con background concentration 29 silicon and so on. So now I'm going to show you uh, the shift of zero peak, one peak, two peak, three peak, and four peak as a function of the fraction of 29 silicon. And they are parallel, and each peak is shift, uh, separated by frequency 43 kilohertz. So that's like the uh, coupling constant. Uh, moreover, you may notice that when background 29 silicon is only 0.01%, it's very sharp, but when, when this is increased to 0.3%, it becomes very wide. So there seems to be a big jump between 
0.01 and 0.3%. And then, of course, the wide, broad peak continues. So here I show you the peak width or half width as a function of the fraction of 29 silicon. And as I said in a previous view graph, uh, we have for, for, the, for the background concerns, concentration larger than 0.1, we have pretty much, or you know, uh, we don't see so steep change in the width, but when uh, background 29 silicon is suppressed down to 0.03%, suddenly peak Y width becomes very sharp. So this is a, this is a good uh, condition for uh, quantum information processing. Okay, so uh, summarizing up to here, we show that electron spin T2 at, well, phosphorus in silicon can go up to 0.6 second, and within this time, 10, more than 10 to the 8 get, uh, gate operation is possible. Nuclear spin T2 is 3 second, and uh, also we have observed uh, uh, un unexpected isotope effect on 31 phosphorus in MR. So my third part is going to be um, uh, electrical detection of phosphorus magnetic resonance states in silicon. I continue with phosphorus, uh, but what we want to do is to detect electron spin resonance in a very low magnetic field. How low? Below 200 Gauss. So we would like to detect electron spin resonance of electron bound to phosphorus below 200 Gauss. Why do we want to do this? At very low field, small field, uh, Hamiltonian of this electron, which is given by electron Zeeman term and also nuclear Zeeman term and the hyperfine term, uh, become basically uh, domin basically this Hamiltonian is going to be dominated by only the hyperfine term because uh, under 200 Gauss, this B and this B becomes negligibly small compared to the hyperfine term. If that's the case, then green level and also the red level here becomes, instead of down up, now the red level becomes down, superposition states of down up, and up down and down up. And also the green level becomes up down plus down up. So basically, uh, we would like to go to low, low field states and try to um, basically realize such superposition states automatically and try to detect such states. And that's, that's our goal. Okay? So in order to do this, uh, because uh, detection of standard electron spin resonance at such, such low field is difficult, we decided to simply try to detect such resonance with electrical means. So it's an electrically detected magnetic resonance. So what we've done is that we place two contacts on naturally available silicon doped with phosphorus. And then uh, place such sample inside magnet and shine lamp to create electron hole pairs inside. And then we perform electron paramagnetic, par paramagnetic resonance. Uh, in such system and try to measure change in the conductivity of such sample. So we just measure change in conductivity of such sample. Okay? And here's the results. <clears throat> what we do is that we scan magnetic field between minus 150 to plus 150 with, res uh, with continuous re uh, irradiation of, for example, 100 megahertz uh, radio frequency or microwave. In this case, we did same measurement but with irradiation of 200 megahertz uh, microwave. And all we are doing is just measuring the change in the conductivity of the sample. And then what we see is that we see clear change in the conductivity as we scan the magnetic field with uh, irradiation of 100 megahertz and so on. And with 200 megahertz, we see more peaks, which is basically a change in the conductivity. And it turns out that the peak, for example, here, shown by purple, corresponds to this transition here, 
orange corresponds to this transition here, the black corresponds to this transition, and red corresponds to this transition. Usually, the transition between here and here corresponds to NMR, just flipping of the nuclear spins. However, in our case, the red is, become, is now superposition of up, down, and down, up. So what we are really detecting here is not NMR, but also electron spin resonance. And with such conditions, we can actually compare shift of different peaks here, I show change similar measurement uh, with two, 20 megahertz all the way to 240 megahertz irradiation. And we see nice change in the peak position. And then we can show that we have actually observed uh, transition for all these different levels. And uh, that can be compared directly with theory without, of course, theoretical, theoretical calculations without any approximations. So we have magnetic field versus our RF uh, frequency of the microwave we applied, and then the solid points, so, sorry, solid curves correspond to our calculation, and points correspond to our measurements. So we have indeed uh, achieved uh, the transition, for example, between up-down plus down-up and down-down states and so on. So and we can actually change the super alpha and beta the superposition coefficient simply by changing the amount of magnetic field. So we change the magnetic field between 550 to zero, zero here. And in, in the case of high magnetic field, we have standard e EPR or electron spin resonance. But below 200 Gauss, suddenly, the in, sorry, this is showing the intensity of the change of the conductivity. Change in conductivity becomes different and this corresponds to change in the coefficient alpha and beta as a function of the magnetic field. So we are basically changing alpha up down plus beta down up and alpha beta coefficients simply by magnetic field. We have theory explaining why this is happening but this is little involved so I'm going to skip that. 12, 12 minutes means including discussions? No. no. Okay, so I have one more topic. Okay, so I have one more topic. Uh, finally, I would like to talk about detection of nuclear spin states of phosphorus optically. So how do we uh, detect optically the nuclear spin states of phosphorus embedded in silicon? Uh, again, um, we are using silicon depleted of background 29 silicon nuclear spin. So it's all 28 silicon and we have phosphorus. Uh, usually in a low temperature, phosphorus binds only one electron, just like hydrogen. But if we shine light, we can actually excite uh, the phosphorus into another state, uh, which is called bound ex ex exonic states. So we now if we shine light, we can form bound, ex ex exciton bound to phosphorus. And in this case, we have two electrons and one hole bound to phosphorus. Okay? And then we can observe uh, light coming out of this uh, defect when electron and hole recombines uh, and then exciton annihilates. Number of uh, transitions we expect for this system is 12. And it's 12 because in the ground state, ground state meaning that after transition, after collapse of the exciton, we have phosphorus with one electron bound to it. So the ground state is just a simple Zeeman singlet and triplet four states. But then when we have exciton, because it's determined by whole character, we have minus thir three half to plus three half Four, trans, uh, four levels, four, four level, energy levels. And then we have, depending on the, uh, after consideration of the uh, uh, selection rules, we have 12 transitions between excited states and uh, ground states. So here we show the photoluminescence uh, excitation spectroscopy of phosphorus in natural silicon and also in 28 silicon. In the case of natural silicon, we only get this 
broad emission. And it's inhomogeneously broad, uh, uh, broad in, uh, emission. However, if we put phosphorus in isotopically tw uh, enriched or purified 28 silicon, suddenly the emission from phosphorus becomes very sharp. And as you can see, we observe clearly 12 transitions we expected. In fact, there are big, six big transitions with one, each one being doublet. And each one being doublet means, this doublet means one side corresponds to phosphorus, phosphorus nuclear spin up state, the other side corresponds to phosphorus nuclear spin down states. Then separation is 200 nano electron volts. So really, we have, we show that the electrical, or sorry, optical detection of phosphorus 31 nuclear spin states is possible. Okay, so each peak corresponds up, down, down, up, up, down, down, up, up, down, down, up, phosphorus 31 nuclear spin states. Uh, by the way, this was done in collaboration with uh, Mike Thiewels and Simon Fraser University. So next step is to try to burn hole in one of the peaks, meaning that before doing anything, we have these 12 transitions or six big transitions with doublet structures. Now we're going to try to shine extra laser on one of the laser one of the line, call in this case line eight, to perform hole burning kind of experiments. If we burn hole here, so we, sh we keep shining laser here, and then we measure this spectra again, and what we get is this green uh, spectrum. And green spectrum is, shows that this is a nuclear spin up state, down state is suppressed, S down state is suppressed, up state, and so on. So what this means is that simply by burning hole, we can actually align nuclear spins of phosphorus in less than milliseconds. So this is a fast nuclear spin uh, initialization processes, process. And by doing so, uh, in a favorable case, we have been able to obtain 76% polarization of nuclear spins in milliseconds. So this is uh, one of the largest uh, nuclear spin polarization we have achieved uh, with, within millisecond, which is very fast for, for nuclear spins. And this was published in PRL. I forgot to indicate it there. So, so, yeah. so uh, once we know that we can align phosphorus 31 nuclear spins, 76% of them up or down, then the next thing we, want, we, we decided to do is just shine RF to do NMR. So once this is up, by shining RF, we can just go back and forth between up and down, up and down, up and down, just basically there's a Rabi, Rabi oscillation. So this was also observed. Uh, this was also done. And then we have obtained Rabi oscillation, which is shown here, right? Once we align nuclear spins, we just shine RF uh, frequency corresponding to uh, NMR of phosphorus 31 to induce Rabi oscillation, and this was measured. And then uh, also we can perform other type of NMR. And at the end, because the laser can be calibrated so well that we have been able to determine the hyperfine constant of phosphorus 31 to this accuracy with respect to the previously reported 117.53 plus minus two, uh, which was done by standard NMR. So we can actually uh, basically increase the precision of, of accuracy of the hyperfine constant using our method. Okay, then this is my last slide. We can also detect uh, nuclear spin states by current. So what we do here is that we put two contacts on phosphorus dope silicon. This is not a mistake. This is, not, this is really 20 millimeter, not 20 nanometer. It's a big sample. And then 
we shine laser with the frequency in this range, okay? And then depending on what type of frequency we shine, we measure how much photo current we get. And here's a photo change in the photo current I show, and depending on the frequency of the laser we irradiate, we get about 5% change in the photo current, and again, the photo current shows the doublet structures corresponding to nuclear spin up and down, phosphorus nuclear spin up and down in silicon. So, in principle, in the future, we should be able to detect nuclear spin of phosphorus in silicon by selectively shining light that transports only up nuclear spin states or down nuclear spin states. So this is like an optical nuclear, nuclear spin transistor. And if we can do that, we should be able to read out the phosphorus nuclear spin single states uh, electrically. So with this, uh, I would like to summarize my talk. Uh, I have actually introduced four different topics, all on phosphorus and silicon. Uh, coherence time of phosphorus electrons and nuclear spins in silicon have been measured, and by isotope purification, we have achieved T2 up to 0.6 seconds and nuclear T2 up to 2.7 seconds. Uh, novel silicon isotope effects on phosphorus 31 endo frequencies has been uh, introduced, have been observed. Uh, low field magnetic spin resonance of phosphorus was also uh, realized, and optical detection and initialization of phosphorus 31 spins was demonstrated. So thank you very much for your attention.